I, today, I'm going to do, it's going to be a little different today, okay? Um, it's not going to be sort of how I traditionally do, uh, you know, in, in preaching a sermon. Today, I'm really just going to tell a bunch of stories is, is what I'm going to do. Uh, let me read this passage to you, give you an introduction of what I'm going to do, why I'm going to do it, and then, then I'll just actually do it, right? Um, so chapter 13, verse 3, he says, Remember the prisoners as if, as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. So since during this weekend, it's a time of remembrance, and it's a time of remembrance uh, of pe- for people who have, who have suffered and who have sacrificed for our country, what I would like to do and what I, what I hope happens is that I want to kind of intertwine into that, and I want you to also be remembering uh, tomorrow and through this weekend the fact that there are people uh, who suffer and who are in prison all over the world today for one reason and one reason only, and it is for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this verse tells us that we are to remember those people. Uh, one of the uh, ancient uh, writers that used to write, he wasn't a Christian, but he wrote about Christians during the early days. And he said these people, he basically was saying, I'm not too sure what to think about these people. Because if they ever hear about one of their brothers or sisters, or one of their, someone who's a part of them, if they ever hear about them being in prison, they immediately go to them. And they even immediately gather up resources to take to them. You know the word redeemed is a word that meant that you could pay the price. You could pay, I guess we'll call it like a fine. You could pay a price that would set a convicted criminal free, right? And it said said and written that in those early days of the early church that some people would literally sell themselves into slavery to raise the money to redeem those uh, of their brothers and sisters and a part of them who had been put into prison uh, and they wanted to, to pay that price. Um, you know, Jesus in Matthew chapter 25, in, and I didn't give these guys the verses, so it's not their fault if they don't get up there. But if Matthew chapter 25, and I think it actually starts in verse 35 or verse 36. You know, that's the passage where Jesus at the end, he says at the end, he said, I'm going to divide the sheep from the goats and I'm going to look at them and I'm going to say I was... I was hungry, and to the sheep, he's going to say, I was hungry, and you fed me. I was uh, naked, and you clothed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. Uh, I was a stranger. You took me in. Uh, I was sick, and you came to me, and I was in prison, and you visited me. It's part of who we are to be as a people uh, to remember those uh, who are suffering uh, for the sake of the gospel. At the end of Colossians, you know, Peter asks at the end of his letter in Colossians 4, 18, he just simply says, remember my chains. He just, it's, it's very simple and we don't put a lot of stock into it, but, it, but it's almost like uh, Paul. I, said, I think I said Peter, but I meant Paul. Uh, but it's almost like Paul was saying to them, you know, just, just don't forget where I'm at. <laughs> just don't forget what's happening to me and don't forget what I'm going through. You know, Jesus said, whatever you want men to do to you, that you also should do to them. And I can tell you that if you were in prison, the last thing you would want is for people to forget about you. It's the last thing you want. I'm going to tell a story. We're going to watch a video. And then I'm going to tell a bunch more stories. Not a bunch more, but several more. So there was a Laotian man. And... uh, he uh, would end up spending, I don't know, 15 to 20 years in prison because he possessed Bibles, man from Laos. He was uh, arrested. He was taken to prison. He was beaten frequently. Um, he writes that in the early days in solitary and with the beatings, you know, he wrote, I can handle the starvation. I can handle the isolation. He said, but there's two things. I need a Bible, and I don't want to be forgotten. He said that in the early days, he would recite all the Bible verses that he could remember, but as as hunger and the beatings took hold, 
his mind began to slip a little bit and he couldn't always, the words didn't come to him. He desperately wanted a Bible and he did not want to be forgotten. After a few years, now so we're talking about years here. After a few years, the prison guards began to trust him. They would trust him enough to send him out every day to cut down firewood for the next day. And so what he did was, is he would go out into the jungle and he would work as hard as he could and he would cut enough firewood for two days. And he would hide one bundle in the jungle and he would bring in the other bundle that they could use the next day. So the next day when he went out, because he already had a bundle stashed, he made a journey to his home. And in his home, he got a Bible. And he took the Bible and he brought it back so that he could have it with him. He took every opportunity. He tore pages out, folded them up, hit them in cracks in the cement. He did whatever he could to have a Bible. He wanted a Bible. The other thing that I told you that he wanted and that he prayed for is he didn't want to be forgotten. <laughs> After years, so there's a ministry out there called Voice of the Martyrs. And go look it up. It's really a good ministry. <clears throat> and uh, at one point, uh, a few years back, uh, the Voice of the Martyrs made this man a... Uh, they gave his name and where he was being held, and they asked Christians all over the world to pray for him and, sending him, and send him a letter. And uh, uh, so one day, years ago, suddenly basketfuls of letters began to show up at, prison, at this prison in Laos for this Laotian man. And he talks about the joy that filled his heart because he knew he was not forgotten. So what I want to do today, and the reason I'm doing this, we need to just remember them. And we can't let them be forgotten. Even if they don't know, we know, and the Lord knows, and we can't let them be forgotten. So um, watch this story of this young Iranian girl. My brothers and sisters, I'm with you tonight. The Lord has a special message for you tonight. If you're hopeless, if you're oppressed, if you're planning to commit suicide, the Lord says stop. He has a hope and a future for you. If you're planning to kill yourself, stop and call me. 
کاری که کردم انجام میدم و اگر تو بخوای پشیمون بشی من خودم پناهی شما شما گوکت وقتی که رفتم توی اتاق دیدم مومنم داره دایی تو برای میکنم نه نه به من ندیان نه چونش میگم نمیخوام با شرف بزنم بلا ندیم نمیخوام قبل کن بینم چی داری خدا فردینم نمیخوام نمیخوام قبل کن زده جالت بکنم خورموز مگه کیه بلا کن کشیش خورموز کیه ولی ولی شما She was cold, she was fighting, and she told me very proudly, I'm going to kill myself, and your Jesus cannot do anything for me. After about an hour of arguing with her, uh, and I couldn't change her mind. I don't want to You said it yourself. Allah has done nothing for you. Give Jesus just one chance. You can always kill yourself next week. وقتی که این فکر اومد توی سرم گفتم این بهترین راهی که یه بار دیگه تا آخرین لحظه برگم به الله خدمت کنم She was thinking, okay, I'll pray you and next week, this time Jesus had not done anything for me I call uh, live on the air and I tell everybody look, I tried Jesus for a week and nothing has changed and I'm going to kill myself tonight and I will do it on the air و بعد از یک هفته که خودکشی میکنم حد اقلش اینه که وقتی به حضور خدا میرم میگم آخرین کارم رو برای تو انجام دادم فرد صبحش که از خواب بیدار شدم ساعت نیمه شب بود که از خواب بیدار شده بودم و دیدم که مامانم خیلی راحت داره تو خونه را و دیگه اونطوری نیست که تعادل نداشته باشه یا دستش جایی بگیره گفتم ما باید سریع بریم بیمارستان و وقتی که جواب رو سریع گرفتیم دکتر گفتش که فقط میتونه بگه یه موجزه شد چون هیچ اصلی از بیماری ام اس نیست آخه چه جوری میشون شما خودتون گفتین که اینشون ترمیم این فقط نشون میده خانم یه موجزه است و به یه امام دعا کردی شما کجا نشون میده چرا خانم فقط این همین نشون میده چیزی من نمیبینم من به هیچ امامی دعا نکرد I love that story. The doctor's like, what imam did you pray to? What imam did you pray to? And she said, I prayed to Jesus. And at that moment, what did she say? The moment I said those words, my heart was changed. Amen. Where do I want to start? 
in Pakistan uh, if they become Christians they are basically banished banished from their families banished from their societies uh, they are banished to simply serve the Muslim people they they will never get a good job and they know they will never get a good job they will only be able to uh, collect garbage, clean out the sewers, and by cleaning out the sewers, they literally get in the sewers with a bucket to, to, to clean them out. They are forced into servitude. They have no voice in government, and they know that it will never change. And yet they still serve the Lord. This one pastor says, the one thing we are thankful for is that we actually have a place where we can get together and worship the Lord. He is grateful that God hasn't forsaken them. He asked the people to pray that, um, that they would continue to have fellowship with each other, to pray that they would continue to have the joy of the Lord. And at the end he said, and I want you to know something, we're praying for you. Here's a church, here's a people of God that live as outcasts in their society and yet they are praying for others. I may be saying these names wrong, Sung Chul, North Korea. In North Korea, he was taught as a little boy, they taught them as a little boy that missionaries were actually terrorists and that missionaries will be nice to you for a little bit of time, but then they're going to get you into their home. They want to kill you and eat your liver. That's, that's what they're taught, that, that they're, they want to kill you and eat your liver. Well, we know and, uh, that North Korea is stricken by extreme poverty um, because of how they are. Um, and during this extreme poverty, this man braved, braved the law, crossed the border into China to pick mushrooms so that he could try to sell them. While he was picking these mushrooms, he met a Chinese man. And uh, the Chinese man could speak Korean, North Korean. And the Chinese man said, well, you want me to sell those? You want me to go sell those for you? And he said, well, sure. So the Chinese man took them to the market and he sold them and he brought them back. And he said, the man gave me all my money. He didn't cheat me. He didn't steal from me. He gave me everything. And this went on for a couple of years, and finally he asked the guy, he said, um, why, why do you do this for me? And he said, because I'm a Christian, and I believe in Jesus. He was actually a pastor, Pastor Han was his name. And he was kind of a missionary that he ministered to the North Koreans. He lived right there on the Chinese-North Korean border. Well, this guy immediately was afraid. He was afraid the guy wanted to kill him and eat his liver. That's literally what he said. So immediately he was, he, he was afraid, but yet there was something, there was something that drew him back. One day he, asked, he actually asked for a Bible. Pastor Han didn't want to give it to him. He said, because I know if you get caught with this Bible, I know what's going to happen to you. You see, to even say the name God in North Korea, to even say God, is punishable by death. To possess a copy of the scriptures, when he went home and told his wife, she ran because just hearing him say it to her would put her in danger. He actually was brave enough to share with his friend that he had a Bible. And again, his friend was like, don't even show me that. I can't, I can't even look at that. I can't see that. And actually in North Korea, if they catch you, it's not just you they're going to punish. It's your whole family. It's anybody that's connected to you. You know, eventually one day his wife, she believed, as did he. One day they were watching TV and they were giving some awards to some military guys who had killed a Chinese missionary. It was Pastor Han. It was in 2016 that they literally watched on TV and understood that their friend 
And the man who had been ministering to them had been killed. And the people who killed him were receiving a reward. There are Christians living, y'all, in this kind of society. In fact, Pastor Han is credited for discipling, actually, over 10,000 North Koreans just through kindness and through the Word of God. Richard Wormbrand was a pastor in Romania. And he was just snatched off the streets one day um, and taken to prison where he would spend uh, 14, 17 years, something like that. He would be beaten. Uh, he was a pastor. He would be beaten relentlessly. He would spend years in solitary confinement. They would arrest his wife eventually and take her to a work camp and force her for a year and a half to work in a work camp. His son would become an orphan. Uh, they would beat him always. They would beat him often. And he would pray. And he would pray. And every time they would see him praying in that cell, they would drag him out and they would beat him. And he would go back and he would pray. One of the things that struck me about Richard Wormbrand, and you can actually, he's actually the... Uh, the inspiration behind the ministry that I told you about, The Voice of the Martyrs. And uh, you can get his book. You can watch a movie about his life. I think it's called Tortured for Christ. Two things that he wrote that, that were interesting to me. One is when he first was in solitary, he was haunted by this question. He said, you know, there are people who believe he said, and then there are people who believe that they believe. And he said, I had to figure out which one I was. Did I really believe or did I just believe that I believed? And he had to come to terms with whether or not he really believed and was going to suffer for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The other thing was, one day he was praying and the guard was furious. The guard, I mean, can you imagine just every time you find somebody doing something, you just beat them, and then every time you turn around, they're just doing it again? I mean, the guard rolls in there and he's just furious and he's screaming and, you know, spitting in Pastor Wormbrand's face. He said, You are so stupid. You're such an idiot. You're praying to this imaginary God. He said, you have lost your wife. You've lost your son. You've lost your life. You've lost everything that was anything to you. What could you possibly have to pray for? And Pastor Wormbrand looked up and he said, I'm praying for you. Jesus said, bless those who persecute you and pray for your enemies. As we remember those in these countries that suffer, let's pray for the persecutors as well as those who are persecuted because they need to know the Lord. A young man named Sutta went to a little village in India. <laughs> and he just, just, he was just a guy. And he would share the gospel. And it infuriated, I guess, I guess the, maybe the village chief or the little village leader, but it just infuriated him. And just, he, 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 he didn't really stir it up, but just, his actions and other people came around and before you know it, you had this mob and before you know it, the mob was worked up and they beat this young man almost to death. In fact, when they left him, they, they really figured he was dead. They had thrown him in a pit and he got home and he was telling his wife and he was like, I can't believe I did that. And she said, well, you, you got to go. You got to go see if he's dead. You got to, you got to go. And so he went to the pit and he found the man, and he was, he was still alive, not moving, not, but he was alive. 
He picked him up and he brought him home. He nursed him back to health. When the guy was strong enough, he gave him his stuff back and said, just go. Four days later, four days later, guess who comes walking into town to share the gospel? He will say, I'm just a simple man, and without prayer, I'm nothing. There are people who serve the Lord in circumstances that we can't imagine. And they need us to lift them up. Even if they don't know we're lifting them up, they need us to lift them up. Last story, kinda, yeah. Church in Nigeria, Christians, whole families at church, they're worshiping the Lord. They're praising God. And suddenly some militants attack the church, begin shooting through the walls, through the windows. Little girl, her daddy's killed, her 10-year-old brother is killed. One of the things she says is she was just running around when it was going on. She was just screaming, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. She said, that's all I had <laughs> at the moment. When they interview her, and, and listen, if you want to see sort of these stories come to life, like the one with Padina, I've put them on Right Now Media. I've put them on my suggestions page. So if you go to the church page and you look for BK suggestions, and it'll be there with all these stories. She sits there, little girl. She's got tears just rolling down her face. And she says, my daddy is not dead. And we will meet again someday. So one of the things that I wanted to do is when I was thinking about this sermon and just, I told myself early last week, I said, I'm going to come in Sunday morning and I'm just going to Google something and see what pops up. I want to get the most recent uh, news or whatever that I can find. Now, I didn't do a lot of, actually, I don't even Google. I use DuckDuckGo. Is it still safe, safe to say I Googled it? Or I duck duck goat it. I don't know. If you don't know what that is, whatever. It's it's a search engine. So, uh, but I, I I googled it. Um, this past week, the military in Myanmar, uh, for some reason, began to bomb a very important Catholic church there in their country. Myanmar is hostile to the gospel. This past Monday uh, in Nigeria, a church was attacked and eight Christians were killed and the church was burned to the ground. Last year, there was a study done and they figured that on average, 11 people a day, 11 people a day die for the sake of the gospel. That's a big number, y'all. 11 people every day die for the gospel. We need to remember them. We need to pray for them. I remember I was with my friend Billy. Billy and I were in a country that's close to the gospel. We had taken some Bibles. We were in a park. We were talking to a young man. He had approached us actually uh, to practice his English. Very young, very young guy. Um, he was probably still in high school. And, uh, but he was super intelligent. That was obvious. He was super intelligent. Spoke very good English. And somehow we began to talk about the Bible. And he said, oh, I'm, I'm familiar with that book. He said, it, it has an old part and a new part. And we're like, yeah, you're right. That's, that was really about all he knew about it, but he at least knew that. In fact, I asked him, I said, how do you, how do you even know that? And he said, well, I, I, I think I've seen one in a library somewhere. And so we told him that we had a new part. If he would like to have it, that we would give it to him. And I'll never forget 
him taking that New Testament and he literally held it to his chest. And he said, this is the greatest gift that anyone has ever given to me. Y'all, we take for granted our Christianity, our ability to live it out, our ability to have God's word, and our ability to gather and worship in his name. Because I'm going to use the word most. In most countries in this world, that is not the case. And we need to remember them. And we need to pray for them. And we need to not forget them. Stand up with me, please. That's really what I want us to do today. In fact, here's what I want to do. Um, I'm going to ask Lynn to play. And for right now, we're not going to sing. We might go ahead and stand up here because we might sing something in a minute. But what I'm going to do in the beginning is I'm going to ask Lynn to play something softly. I'm going to ask everyone to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I'm going to ask you to just pray. I'm going to ask you to just pray for churches that meet in hostile places even today. I'm going to ask you to pray for people who are in prison today for the gospel. If you want to come and kneel and pray at the altar, that would be awesome. That would be fine. But I'm just going to ask you to take a few moments and to pray for those who are persecuted and pray for the church that is persecuted. And let's remember them.